If you're having your jewellery designs created from sketches to CAD design, one of the crucial things that manufacturers like ourselves need to factor in is how much casting shrinkage we need to take into account from, for example, when a customer's CAD design is printed into a 3D piece all the way through to the final polished piece. If you're working both with a CAD designer and a jewellery manufacturer, you may have even heard them mention about casting shrinkage, and so I want to talk a little bit more in depth about it today. I'll explain what and why casting shrinkage occurs, why it varies from one supplier to another, and if you are a jewellery designer, explain what we advise our designer customers when they've got designs ready for us to produce. Stay watching and hope you enjoy. If you guys are new here to this channel, welcome. I'm Kim, owner of Thai Design Distributors. We're a third generation family business since 1975, owning our manufacturing plant in Thailand where we specialize in producing high-end sterling silver and gold jewelry. We've got our own in-house range, but the majority of what we do is manufacturing exclusively for our jewellery designer customers. We've always had our head office in the UK and recently a support office in the US. Please do get familiar with this channel by watching my intro video, which gives you an insight about my background in the jewellery industry and the purpose of this channel. Lastly, please don't forget to like or subscribe to the channel for all of the latest tips and videos on jewellery manufacturing. First of all, what is casting shrinkage and the causes? Most metals, whether it's silver, aluminium, copper, zinc, shrink as they solidify, known as solidification shrinkage. My field is in the higher volume metals such as sterling, silver and gold. And it's not just the type of metal, but other contributing factors that causes shrinkage. Let's put this into perspective so it's a bit easier to follow. So from the start and in order, shrinkage occurs during rubber moulding and injecting models. The rubber mould shrinks a bit and so the wax shrinks and distorts in the rubber mould. When we mix in the investment powder in the flask, just the investment alone may cause 1.5 to 3% shrinkage by the way we mix our investment, meaning the water to powder ratio. And it also depends on the investment type. The flask temperatures, metal melting temperatures during casting also all contribute to the shrinkage. Heat expands due to the molecules moving around a lot more in space, so when the metal is really hot, it fills the cavities in the investment, and as it cools, those molecules slow down and take up less space, so it shrinks and becomes more dense. Even the quelching of the silver and the cooling rate adds to the overall shrinkage and so by the end of it you can see that different shrinkage allowances occur during different parts of the casting and now you've got a significant amount of shrinkage over the original piece the mould was made from. What's clear is that the piece needs to be made larger than the desired casting in order to compensate for this type of shrinkage. And judging these allowances requires skill and experience to ensure a high quality finished product. Now, popular alloys such as gold and sterling silver generally have shrinkage of between 1-3%. to However, please don't use this as a general rule of thumb because it depends on each manufacturer's casting process. For example, are they printing the 3D wax or resin directly onto the casting tree and there is no rubber mould? Or are they making a master from the resin before creating the rubber mould, like how we practice at our manufacturing plant? Therefore, shrinkage would typically be more like a 5 or 8%. So different casters will say or advise differently depending on their casting method. For example, let's say you're developing a ring, where typically there can be complications with getting the exact ring size correct. If you were designing a ring to be a size 6, for instance, what size would it be in the CAD or the resin after it's been 3D printed? Depending on how you cast, some casters would just make the CAD or the resin in the same size the customer wishes the ring to finish out as, so in this case a size 6. For them, the shrinkage in size during casting is just about right to allow them to clean up the casting and polish it, particularly inside of the shank. So after they've sanded, filed and polished the ring, it should end up the size the customer needs, a size 6. However, some casters wouldn't cast directly from the resin, but would make a silicone mould from it instead. That wax would be casted to become the master, and then a rubber mould would be created, to which that wax would be the finished casting. In this case, approximately 6-8% to shrinkage would be seen as normal. So like I said, depending on how a caster casts, there are many factors that influence shrinkage. Ultimately, it's really hard and complicated to model. As a manufacturer, we know that casting, to be consistent and reliable, needs to be done as a precision operation. We're not casting a one-off unique piece here, but we're mass producing jewellery, so if we're casting 20 rings of the same size, the results really need to be reliable and consistent. 
So my advice to you is a sample should be made not just for you to quality check things like, you know, the size, the surface, etc. But for us, we need to work out the exact knowledge and note down all the records and temperatures and times used in each various stage of the casting process. We've been keeping records and have overflowing data of each design we cast because with shrinkage, not all the designs will be the same. Not only will keeping a record allow us to predict the results much more completely, but it makes it much easier for us to isolate and solve problems when or if they occur in the future. So it's common for our casters to track or keep a written record so that they can go and look back on. And following or making a slight change in a certain procedure can make all the difference in knowing why something within the casting process did or did not do what we had anticipated. So every caster will have their own formula for the white jewellery pieces to cast metals in. Once we get the formula right, it's then our job as casters to keep it consistent and do it everything the same every time. So a typical test, let's say for a ring, could be making a precise metal model of it. So it's to the exact precise ring size, width, thickness of the band. After making a typical rubber mould for it, we may cast the wax moulds using various temperature combinations because having those actual differences will demonstrate various shrinkages from metal model to the waxes from the rubber mould or from the waxes to the end castings. And then once it's filed and polished, we'll really then have the total final shrinkage from all causes. So the moulding, injecting wax, casting and polishing losses. So if your supplier is creating your CAD design and they inform you that they need to add 5% or a 7% shrinkage into your CAD file or they've asked you to add, I don't know, a 3% to the CAD, just remember that there is no correct rule of thumb regarding the correct percentage to add for casting shrinkage. But trust that your supplier is relying on their own casting formula. The nature of solidification, remember the transition from the liquid state to the solid state, will include a volume change and that shrinkage can affect the finished design. So if you're a jewellery designer where you've created some highly textured surfaces or designs that include some fine filigree on the surface, if there is too much shrinkage on the final piece, those particular details can be lost or diminished after casting, filing and polishing. So bear that in mind if you have designs in that nature and make it clear to your supplier that the shrinkage in their casting must be carefully managed in order to not lose those details. Otherwise, you may need to scale up your original design if you're losing a higher percentage in shrinkage to ensure that they're able to retain those finishing details. One of the important information that we need from our customers if we are working with their CAD designs is that they inform us what they want the final measurements of that design to be. I'm referring to all the lengths, height, widths, thicknesses of the designs. Make it crystal clear what you're expecting the final outcome to be and we'll work on adding the correct casting shrinkage to it. And you know, from experience, a lot of the times the first cast may come out white, but at times it doesn't, and we can spot what went wrong earlier in the process or sometimes after it's been polished. This is why developing a first sample is so crucial, and we tell our customers that, look, we'd love to have their order, but to be safe, let's just take this slowly and surely and create a sample of each new design first. So be patient with your manufacturer, guys. We work with so many new CAD designs from our customers. Once we get the first sample right and we have a perfect mold ready to go, then it's straightforward really thereafter um, because the hard part of developing the first sample is done. We've established the correct casting shrinkage and then it's just a matter of following the formula and procedure for the mass production order. For more information and detail on casting, watch this video um, that we did earlier on the stamping versus casting video. And that's it for now. I hope you guys found that helpful. Please don't forget to like, subscribe to the channel um, and follow us for all of our future videos on jewellery manufacturing. Take care and see you next time. Bye.